So I have been grappling with the Facebook and have not been successful. I did everything I usually do and it smells fear and then it goes away. So I'm so excited to be here in the gathering room for all of y'all on Instagram. And the Facebook, we will post this on Facebook as soon as we are done. Those of you who are used to Facebook, maybe you could go to Instagram or maybe read a good book or take a bath. In the meantime, we've got people showing up. We've got Laura and Dr. Donna's here and Gina is here and Marsha and Tiffany. Oh, hello, Rowan, the gracious badger. She's here. Hi, big Canadian and Dawn and Tracy. It's so great to see you guys. Thanks for waiting during the fraught minutes that I grappled with the Facebook. And it can smell when Rowan isn't here also. Not that she is, no one else can tell by scent if she's here or not, but when she's not here to work her magic. I once worked with a computer programmer who was trying to teach me to do things and we would do things keystroke for keystroke the same and my computer would like die and he would do it himself. Finally, he told me, I'm not joking about this. He told me, put in the code, check the code, then stand up and hit enter on your computer and run. He said, it is known among computer scientists that when we're tired and when our energy is, you know, kind of fritzy, computers break. It was one of my happiest times because it told me that, yes, it is true. We are projecting electromagnetic energy all the time and other things can feel it. Other people, other computers and Facebook, which apparently hates me. Anyway, let's get to the topic of today. So glad. I'm so glad to have you here. And very ironically, our topic for the day is triggering bliss. So I thought, oh, I, I was very blissed out today because I was writing about this and I thought, oh, this kind of works. I'm going to tell the peoples about it on the gathering room so we can all be in bliss together. So you start out wherever you are. And um, the way we're going to, let me tell you a little bit about the neuroscience from what I understand. I've talked to you before about how most of your anxiety lives on the left side of your brain where the right side is responsible for a lot of creative connections. And while you're deeply invested in creating connections, that is learning interesting things, they have to interest you, this is key. You move out of the vicinity of the brain where you feel anxious. So you're working circuits that aren't anxious and that's, that's my goal with it. But it just so happens that the way I'm doing this, not only will you stop feeling anxious, but you will go into a state of bliss while developing special skills. How cool is that? What are the special skills? Anything you're interested in. You have to be interested in it. It can't be anybody else saying, this is an interesting thing, you have to do this. I was writing about how when I was diagnosed with ADD, I was asked to sit and click a mouse on a computer every time a dot appeared in a certain quadrant of the screen. And it wasn't hard. But after the first 15 minutes, nothing changed. I was getting a little bored. So I started thinking about other things. I kept clicking away, but I was thinking about, you know, training my beagle, how to get him to stop howling, going roller skating, whatever. And the brain mappers who analyzed my results, they said, yeah, you have a very defective brain. You have serious ADD. And this is defined as not focusing entirely for long periods of time on things that do not interest you. Also, they said, I have a, a, another problem that goes along with it, which means I tend to focus on things that interest me. Shocking. How can you be a good cog in the great machine of materialist produ production if you are interested in things and not doing the things they tell you to do? The boring, dull things. So yeah, my whole thing is that the reason, one of the reasons we're so anxious is that we spend our whole lives being told that we have to live in the left side of the brain that will take its orders and re replicate these skills like a little robot and never wander off on our own trains of thought. That's what's considered laudable. That's the brain you want is the brain that never does what it's interested in. I don't believe that. So my first step into bliss that is out 
of the anxiety cycle and in, in you know, on the left side of your brain and into a different space is detecting where you are interested. I have been coaching for over 30 years and I'd say about only 10% or less of the people I've coached can tell me what they're interested in. What? We literally lose our, our contact with what interests us? Well, we have to, or we'd want to kill the people who are telling us to sit in fluorescent offices doing horrible jobs over and over while our wild and precious lives slip away. So yeah, you get to recover your interests, but you've been trained not to. And, and because of that, the anxiety in your brain can be very loud, while the curiosity is quite subtle. I love what Liz Gilbert says in Big Magic, her book on creativity. She says, even if something interests you just enough that you will, you might turn your head a quarter inch to the left to look at it, follow that interest. If that's the most curious you can be, go with that. Curiosity is the doorway out of hell and into bliss. I promise you, we talked about this last week. So your job right now is to choose something you find interesting can be anything, but something you've done a little bit of before in your life. So for me, like I watched the great pottery throw down. I've never made pottery, but I'm interested in it. I like to go, uh, I, I love to paint and draw. I love to make cheesecakes. I love, you know, identifying leaves and animal markings and things. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be literally anything, cars, jewelry. I don't care. Just so you're genuinely interested in it. Now, your next job is to become a mimic. This is where you turn on a part of your brain that is really magical. It, you find, and YouTube, bless its heart, is our best friend here because if you can identify something that you're interested in and then go watch people do it on YouTube, you may find someone who is doing what you're interested in at a little bit higher level than you've ever done it. So, that's where you don't want to be watching like Olympic ice dan dancing where they do quadruple twists. That's that's just not even human. You want to look at somebody making a pot just a little bit better than any pot you've ever made or a quiche just a little bit prettier than any quiche you've ever made. So just the, something that when you look at it, you go, oh, and then you think, I think I could do that. Hmm. We have this amazing two year old in our house, Lila. And she is in the stage called language explosion. And she's also exploding with skills that she learns by observing. She imitates everything. She's a little imitation machine. And we knew this <laughs> the other day when she ran past a room full of guests and she never walks, she runs. Rawr! And she just, she puts her arms out because she's not really steady, you know, especially around the corners. So she's careening around the house. Do, 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 do. And as she runs past a, a room of our guests, she says, oh, shoot, except she didn't say shoot. She said a different word that sounds like shoot. Because that apparently is what we shout while we're running through the house. If we ever have to run through the house, that's what we end up saying. And she just internalized that. So we're reinforcing the fact that it's shoot, not a different word that sounds like shoot. But the amazing thing is watching how she just absorbs. And it reminded me of um, a book called The Inner Game of Tennis, which came out in the 70s, when tennis was quite a fad at the time. And they found that people who got lessons from tennis teachers, these were absolute beginners who'd never done it before, people who got a lesson from a tennis teacher didn't play tennis as well as people who had no lessons, but who watched people playing very excellent tennis. And then they would say, go out and just become that person, do what that person did. So when you do that, it kicks into this mimicry part of you and you start to embody something you've seen. So when you go look at your YouTube thing about something that interests you, you want to get to the moment where you're going, how did they do that? Like, how did they make that exact, that run on the violin? How did they, uh, you know, how did they get the cake to rise like that? How did they make a cake that looks exactly like my beagle? How did, you know, how did they do it? And as soon as you start thinking, how did they do it? And then pretending you're them, and then you start practicing, that 
is what Mihai Chicks and Mihai called flow. That is where you sort of you drop into the nonverbal side of yourself and you start to embody this image of something that you've already imprinted on your brain. And there can be moments of frustration, but as you sink into it and pretend that you're them, you may get to the place where you forget that you're you. And you start to just mimic. One thing you can do that a lot of people really um, can use this way is go to a song you love with a, a singer with a great voice. And instead of singing along as you, become that singer. And try it with different things. Try it with opera and country and um, heavy metal. And become that person and sing with their voice. And it wakes up, I think, two things. One is your innate capability to create what you're interested in. And the other thing is that communion between souls and between bodies that makes us feel each other. It feels connected. So we get those two things that um, brain scientists tell us are active when people are in blissful states of meditation. We let go of our sense of needing to control because we're not controlling, we're imitating. And we let go of our sense of self because we're pretending to be this other person that we've just watched. And you can actually gain skills this way really, really fast, but you can also learn the sort of uber skill of flipping into a creative mindset. And the more people you watch, like going, how does he do that? How, how did that? I remember doing this when I was getting TV makeup. I would watch the makeup artist work on my own face and go, how is she doing that? You know? Or I watch, um, I, I read Rilke and my whole soul feels like it's expanding. And I'm like, how did he do that? I found out for one thing that he, that Rilke will blend senses. Like he'll talk about visual things as if they're sound or vice versa and like that. Like I've picked up a lot of writing skills by reading stuff that's amazing. Like Liz Gilbert and going, how did she make Eat, Pray, Love sound so breezy? Because I know it wasn't breezy. It's an incredibly capable piece of writing. And it just hits the right voice immediately. And then she switches voice completely for different novels. And I just think, how did she do it? And then I pretend that I can do it. And then I go to work and I can't quite do it at first, maybe not even for a while, but I do start to dissolve my sense of identity and I start to see different results coming out of my own little brain and fingers. And that right there, when you're in that space, is so blissful. Oh my heavens, I truly think it's a little piece of enlightenment right there for all of us, just hanging out there where the babies are. And you also get little God winks to tell you you're on the right track. So Rowan and I have another podcast, Bewildered, which frankly uh, is much more fun than this one because Rowan's there. And the other day we set up all the technicals and we were getting ready to record, but we'd had all these technical problems like we did today. And I was kind of bummed. So I was like, how am I going to be funny and chatty? So I said to Ro, I need to imitate someone funny and chatty. And I was going to tell a story about the gray and red squirrels that are having fights in our backyard. This was my plan. So Ro says, I know just the thing. And she puts on a recording of a radio show with Russell Brand and a friend of his. And they're hilarious. And what are they talking about? She just randomly chooses out of years worth of radio programs. They're talking about red and gray squirrels and how they fight. Like, that's such a bizarre topic. I didn't even know red squirrels existed until I Googled one the other day because it was in my backyard. And it was my brand new thing to talk about. And there it was, Russell Brand joking about squirrels so that I could pretend I was Russell Brand joking about squirrels and therefore make my own jokes about squirrels along with the faith that something's looking out for me because what a bizarre topic. Okay, so you have been sending in questions on my, um, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) and Rose's been texting them to me. So I have a few here. Let's talk about them now. So Filamental says, I've heard that researching, learning, or watching the thing you want to do can trick the dopamine enough to give you a reward just enough 
to possibly keep you from actually doing the thing yourself. Is that a possible downside? How to maintain enough interest to really do it ourselves? I think if you keep watching and the dopamine keeps hitting you, it pulls you. Like every time you get that hit, you need a little bit more. It's like an addiction. You need a little bit more the next time. Eventually, you're going to start playing around with stuff. You're going to start thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to write my own song. Or I think I could play the ukulele like Izzy does. Izzy, I can't pronounce his last name, Hawaiian, amazing singer. You know, I, I, I think I'm going to actually start playing the ukulele. And, and you just, just tiptoe into it. Tiptoe into the skill building. But if nothing else, that dopamine hit is going to put you in bliss. And you don't have to make anything to make it worth your while. The bliss is the point, right? So if you just want to watch people doing amazing, like Olympic skiing or whatever, and never go out and do it yourself, you can still be in bliss just by imagining being them. Why not imagine being everybody? We're all connected, so our consciousness is experiencing all the things. Why not tap into the abilities of somebody who's doing something you can't ever do in this body? Why not use their bliss? Just hitch a ride. All right, um, Damara says, Damara says, how did you do it with your books? You analyzed a bunch of data on how humans work and distilled the best parts into a very flowy books. It's very unique. Thank you. Who did you imitate for that data crunching? Oh my goodness. I will tell you. I will tell you my trade secret. This is my deepest secret. I wrote hundreds of articles using this secret and many books. And the secret has two words. Dave Barry. He was a humor columnist for the Miami Herald and was once called by a critic, the funniest man alive. I don't know if his writing will age well. I have to like keep reading funny people. Um, Hannah Gadsby, oh my gosh. If you haven't seen her uh, stand-up shows, um, the first one's called, e -e, it'll come to me. The second one is called Douglas. What is her first one called? Anyway, uh, her name is Hannah Gadsby and she's a genius at comedy and she explains it while she's doing it and makes it still, she's a genius. Go look at her. Um, but yeah, I re I, I crunch a bunch of data and then I read things that make me laugh. And I write something really boring and then I go through it and say, how is this different from Dave Barry? How did he do that? How did he make me laugh out loud on a bad day when I was just sitting around eating a salad? And there are, there are little tricks that he uses and I imitate him and they come out and sure enough, people pay me to write. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I love you. Uh, Jessica says, I used to pretend I was Julia Child cooking when I was little. This comes to us naturally as children. Why do adults give it up? That is so true, Jessica. We are natural mimics and we're that way throughout our lives unless we're taught to be otherwise. And that is exactly what the culture does to us. I was working on this chapter that I'm writing and we were hosting some wonderful friends of ours, Kate Groch and her daughter, Maya. Kate is a South African educator who runs these amazing learning centers that we help fund in South Africa. And uh, she's a brilliant teacher, brilliant in so many ways and just a wonderful human being. And I said, so how do you make someone curious? I'd got to the point where I thought, okay, there's a juncture where you can either go into fear or into curiosity, the left amygdala or the right amygdala. How do you get people who are feeling anxious to switch over to curiosity? And I said, so how do you make someone curious? And she said, we're all born curious. The culture just knocks it out of us. And then she said, one of the ways that you can get people curious is just to go quietly over somewhere near them and start doing something programming a computer or playing with blocks or um, quoting Shakespeare, whatever. And don't tell them why you're doing it. Just let their natural uh, response make them curious enough to turn their heads a quarter inch to the right or left, and then they will be interested. It One of the best experiences I had making people interested was when I was um, trying to become invisible uh, I was trying to learn the wood lore of invisibility. I think I've told you this before. So I kept running and hiding from people and it made them incredibly curious about what I was doing. 
it's kind of like playing hard to get. You actually get so involved in your own thing that you turn away from them and do something that fascinates you and other people catch the fascination. So in this case, you're the one who's catching it. So find that person who's doing that thing that makes you turn a quarter inch to the left or right and then um, refuse to give up on it. Refuse to stop mimicking. Refuse to stop being curious. That, that curiosity is your birthright and they take it away from you for a reason so that they can put you down and make you a, a servant of the great machine. We don't want that. No, get back your curiosity and don't let go. Okay, so Data True says, is there a way of using this when you get stuck? Yeah, I think it's very important. I have to repeat this over and over again. Our culture also doesn't validate our need to rest. If you have no curiosity about anything, it's quite possible you need to rest because your brain will shut down everything but rest when you need it. It is absolutely the most important thing to get enough sleep, to get enough rest. The culture says no, the body says, oh yes. So first rest, make sure you're rested and then go back to something that has always tickled you. Like reread something you loved as a kid or, or something you read every few years because you just can't believe how awesome it is. Um, go to things that have worked in the past and just press that button again. It almost always works. Good luck. Okay, Tiffany Nightingale says, sometimes I wonder if when we are mimicking and enter the flow, we join the stream of consciousness our muse was flowing in and we can access the unique contribution we can also make from that space. What a beautiful way of putting it. I think that is absolutely true. Flow is the active side of consciousness, you know, or call it the Tao or call it whatever you want. But as you drop away from the cultural barriers to your curiosity and you let yourself sink into curiosity and mimicry, especially the mimicking part, you do join this group consciousness with whoever you're mimicking and all the people they've mimicked because we all learn by mimicry. And then you're adding your own little things that only your particular point of consciousness could possibly add to the world. You're putting your own spin on it and that has its own sweetness. And then it feeds back into the collective whole and everybody goes, woo, and then their creativity rises. And then yours, it's, it's a benevolent feedback cycle. So yes, I believe that that's happening at the level of consciousness all the time. And Tiffany, thank you so much for phrasing it so beautifully. How did you do that? Okay, um, Crystal says, I also have ADD, which results in not sticking with interests. Now I don't want to start anything new because I'm afraid the interest won't last and I'll end up with a closet full of paraphernalia. This is when it's time to actually reconnect with the culture. So there's different phases of the creative process. There's the part where you generate ideas. There's the part where you mimic and grapple and tr try to create something new. And then there's a part where you come back into connection with a person, but make sure it's a, a familiar and um, the right person. A person who understands you, who whom you respect and love, preferentially. Um, at least you have to like them because there will come a time when it's hard to go on. I've been um, experiencing this lately because I always, I used to be a workout junkie for, I had 10 years of, well, 12 years of extreme chronic pain. And then when it was finally diagnosed as fibromyalgia, my doctor said, don't rest anymore because I was sick of resting. Go work out the very muscles that hurt, which was weird. And it hurt more at first, but then it sort of broke through. And I started being able to work out and I loved it. And I did that for years. But then just as we moved to Pennsylvania, one of my feet gave out. It, it developed really bad bursitis, which I had surgery for and it's back 100% now. But... I am doing physical therapy with a really good physical therapist. And this thing I used to love doing by myself, working out was my solitary time. Put in earphones, nobody got to talk to me, nobody got to come interrupt me. I did it myself. And guess what, I can't do it myself anymore. But as soon as someone I admire who has really good skills, she can, she can work one tiny muscle so that I get stronger without being injured. And knowing that she is there, I said to her, even when I'm done with physical therapy, I am going to come to you 
so you can help my whole body stay strong. And she was like, okay. And I realized that I reached that point in my own creativity toward fitness where I needed that extra person. I needed the expert. It happened to me with drawing. When I finally, I got to Harvard and I had a drawing class with a man who became my one of my favorite mentors in my life. And it was like I'd been groping my way through a jungle with my hands. And he showed up and gave me a machete and a map and said, follow me. And just was able to teach me how to learn. I, you know, he was a brilliant artist. I'd watch him. I'd go, how is he doing that? And then I would say, how are you doing that? And he could explain it to me. And I could draw something and he would say, here's where, where you went wrong. Yes. So if you're an ADD person who doesn't always finish, you don't have to have ADD to be sort of defeated by trying to finish a task. That's not the point of this lesson, by the way. The bliss is the point. But sometimes pushing into the hard place where you get it to actually be something is also blissful. And start looking for partners, start looking for inspiration, start looking for teachers. If you open your um, attention to that and you really want it, you'll find them, they'll find you. And then you will just start doing incredible things because that's what people do. Kay Nielsen says, imposter syndrome is so powerful. How do I overcome it? So that's on your fear circuits and it's verbal. Verbal thought is on the left side of your brain. I really strongly suggest that you go do something with your body in motion that is enjoyable to you and too difficult to do while worrying about imposter syndrome. Like, I don't know, holding an egg on a spoon and running around with it. Uh, in our um, Wild New World class this last week, I had people write their signatures the usual way and then write them backwards and then write them backwards and upside down and then the regular way upside down. And while they were doing that, every single person, I, I set them up. I said, first, you're going to think of a problem, get all worried, worry about imposter syndrome, whatever. Now, write your name backwards and upside down. And while they were learning to do that, while they were in the struggle and I did it so they could see. And then when they started doing it themselves, everything got very still. And when they were done, I said, okay, so how many of you were able to stay worried while you were in the process of figuring out how to write your name backwards? And they all had gone into the bliss zone, into the, the part of the brain that moves things physically, that processes visually and holistically, that isn't thinking in words. It's not hard to turn it on, but they won't let you. No, they don't want you there. They want you to sit at your little computer terminal pressing a button endlessly so that money can be made and rainforests can be destroyed. I don't know. So here's our last question. I'm going a little long because I was struggling with Facebook like an alligator before I came in. So this is from Baba's Girl. What if fluctuating attention has been so unwieldy that you now distrust it? Well, I can't imagine distrusting attention. It's just a thing. I can distrust my ability to get things finished, I guess, but attention is simply the little part of us that goes, Ur! and there's always something that makes you go, Ur! go online and Google the Omo people of central Ethiopia and look at the way they paint their bodies. Google party colored, huge, giant squirrel. And you will see a massive squirrel from India that weighs 40 pounds and is, I kid you not, blue and purple and orange. I am not even kidding. Google it. Um, let's see, anything not related to animals that I can lead you to? Yes, watch people throwing pots. Uh, watch people, uh, mm, I don't know, climbing a tree. Whatever you like to do as a child, whatever you enjoyed as a child, watch someone doing that. You will have fluctuating attention. That's okay. It goes away, you bring it back. That's what meditation is. You sit down, you pay attention to your own brain, then you lose attention. All right, bring it back. No problem. The job of attention is to wander. Our job is to bring it back to things that give us bliss. And the way we do that is to mine our curiosity, rediscover that curiosity that you had when you were a little kid running through the house going, oh, shoot! And do it with your friends. Do it with, do it with your family. Just 
have fun mimicking the things that you wish you knew how to do because that curiosity is still inside you and the will to master is still inside you and the ability to mimic incredible things is bigger in you than it's ever been before. So try this, get into the bliss zone. You won't notice time passing and you may forget you, you even did it because your talking mind won't remember it. But if you do go into the bliss zone, put a little check mark on your calendar so you remember to go back again. They don't want us to go there, but that doesn't mean we can't. All right, you guys, see you on the every when, and I hope someday on Facebook. Mwah, 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 mwah.